One of the most intriguing photographers of the 20th century took her first known pictures here. Her photos weren't seen in her lifetime. Most she didn't even print, but saw just once in her viewfinder as she took them. It was 3,000 miles away in America that Vivian Meyer spent her life. She worked as a nanny, and every day she took pictures, 150,000 of them. She was a poet of suburbia, a secret street photographer before the term was really invented. Just before she died, four years ago, her life's work was discovered by accident in storage lockers in Chicago. It proved a treasure trove for the finders. People found it hard to believe that Mary Poppins with a camera could have taken these pictures. It's a classic parable of the artist, unsung in life. Van Gogh once said, stars are the souls of dead poets, but to become a star, you have to die. I was the manager of a movie theater here in Chicago. I noticed her because she was kind of an odd bird and uh, uh, she came probably three or four times a month for 13 years. And she was also the type of person I think you could potentially wonder if she was a little crazy. I did notice her camera, but with her vintage clothing, I just thought it was part of the costume. The rest of my staff at the theater thought she was mean. They would say, oh, I don't want to deal with her. Jim, can you go talk to her? And I never saw her come with anybody, and I never saw her talk to anybody. After the films, she would be leaving at 11 or midnight. Yeah, I would wonder where she would go. Didn't seem homeless, but she seemed close. She loved seeing a Buster Keaton film with children in the room. They would be laughing and the piano would be playing and it was just a really magical moment. Did you know she was a nanny? No idea. To be honest with you, I was a little afraid to try to know too much about her. Now I sort of regret not prying a little bit and finding out about her life. It seems so interesting in retrospect. And I was just a little bit afraid to get deep with this woman, you know. This is Inga Raymond, one of Vivian Meyer's charges. Vivian took hundreds of photographs of Inga, almost all of which she's never seen before. Many were taken on this beach. If Miss Meyer was out here, she would wait until one of the kids was crawling right between that little ice cave hole. And that was where she would take a picture. When the printer was printing mm -hmm. this print, mm -hmm. he didn't realize someone was hiding inside really? of the culvert. 
Oh my god. All of a gosh. sudden she saw this this eyeball like huh. it makes a very eerie look. But I know what it is. It's one of those uh, large sewer pipes. I love that image because it is so dramatic. It, it's stark. It's uh, film noir almost. If you look at it closely, there is a cross right on the face, right on my face. But it's this almost caged animal look with a cross. <laughs> it's very interesting. When she took her photos, she would be completely and utterly focused. I mean, it was just, you know, an instant, you know, absolute um, concentration. Then it would be done. I think even if she was here, she couldn't explain her photography to us because she didn't like talking about her photography. And most of the people who knew her, and there are very few people who knew her, she never talked about her photography. So everything that we can learn about her is going to come from the pictures because they show us what she liked, what she disliked, what she was drawn to. We really are just left with the images. Vivian Mai used to haunt this market with a movie camera as well as her stills camera. Says I started to heaven. Love better change my mind. Big sail in the Says I started to heaven. Love better change my mind. Says I'm going to stay right here. Where I can have better time. Have mercy, Mr. Percy. Stare, pry, listen, eavesdrop. Die knowing something. You're not here long. So when you lose your money, partner, please don't lose your mind. Needles, nails, hair Says I draw cold water from the Pope Boys eye. The flea market is a shadow of its former self but still the happy hunting ground of pickers, treasure hunters. And pickers love old photos and postcards. Oh, man. You get the trucker photos, I get the racing photos. <laughs> Vivian Meyer's work was brought to light by people just like those she used to photograph. What do you think? I just got it this morning. Ron Slattery was the first to buy Vivian's work at auction in 2007. The Chicago stuff's great. Postcards? Yeah, these are old, old postcards. Roger Gunderson was the auctioneer who sold it to him. Oh, there you go. That's nice. Here's Lake Street with the L, the overhead L. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Vivian Meyer had no home of her own, so she kept her life's work in storage lockers. But in her old age, she was no longer able to pay the rent, so the contents of the lockers were sold. What would she have paid to keep that stuff in storage over the years? The thousands of dollars, I would imagine. Isn't, isn't that sort of tragic in a way, that she puts all her life's work into storage and she's paying out these huge sums of money for it, mm -hmm. and then she loses it all. And then it all goes away, yeah. When her lockers were put up for sale, half a dozen dealers turned up. All they saw were old suitcases and boxes. They'd open the door, you bid from the doorway, you'd look, you couldn't touch. What you see is what you get. And it was always a big gamble you might end up with something worth nothing or you might end up with something worth millions, which, as it happens... <laughs> it happens. <laughs> Roger bought five lockers full of Vivian Meyer's stuff. It filled one and a half trucks, unloaded here in this auction room. Had I known that this thing was going to get as big as it had, I would have saved every crumb of paper I had. And these are the trucks that you put all Vivian's stuff in? Yes, this one right here. But we threw some away. 
personal writings and things like that. Some of that stuff that hindsight being 2020, had we known, we would have kept it. But we, we sold it, we turned it, we made money. You know. The Vivian Meyer phenomenon had begun. Now, New York galleries sell new prints, often made from negatives that Vivian never even developed, for upwards of $2,000. Vintage prints, made in Vivian's lifetime, go for $8,000. It's a complete accident that the world has stumbled on her work. It could very easily have been destroyed without anyone knowing about it. Vivian Meyer, unlike any other photographer I can think of, made her work entirely for herself. She had no audience. She knew no other photographers. Um, she didn't really print her work except in the most rudimentary form. She didn't exhibit her work or publish her work. It was a project entirely self-motivated, uh, entirely self-fulfilling. And this creates a certain freedom, a certain independence. It's her own personal voice. Vivian Meyer worked in a variety of genres. She took street photography, wandering around the streets of Chicago and New York, indigent people on the street because they're on the street, and just marvelously expressive moment. Um, she does wonderful portraits that are of distinctive characters that she is able to capture in a moment. Everything is moving very, very fast. She would definitely be very close in order to capture the way his hair is stuck to his forehead and this anxious expression. She's very much like a poet who's trying to just observe very carefully for personal reasons to look at the world and locate what's important to her, what interests her, capture it in a photograph. It's exceedingly personal. There is humor in her work. This is a picture of one of the children that Vivian Meyer took care of. She photographed while she was working, moonlighting on the job. Some of those remain in the um, realm of snapshots, but many of them transcend that genre and become more observations about children, about family, about the suburbs youth confronting age. Who's going to have the time and the space to be in somebody's backyard taking that kind of picture? A nanny would, you know, who's also a great photographer. I mean, all her self-portraits intrigue me because, uh, you know, they're her and she intrigues me. She was interested in seeing how she fit into the world. We believe that she never fully realized her work, so we are helping her to realize it by printing it in a certain way, by editing it in a certain way, picking the pictures that have meaning to us. Um, you know, it's, it is what it is. It's a very unique case. Ron Slattery owns about 2,000 of Vivian's prints and negatives, which he is not selling. Let's start with this one. Would you tell us what you paid for them? $250. And away we go. For how many photographs? My whole collection. For the same sum, the auctioneer got all five lockers. Did you make a lot of money out of it? Somewhere between 15 and 20,000. Do you wish on some days when you wake up in the morning that you'd actually kept it all? <laughs> well, hindsight being 2020, sure. It's one of my favorites. But when we first started selling this, nobody knew. Even the people buying, I don't think, knew. 
Did you see the photos before you bought them? Nah, I just kind of looked. I was like, oh, neato photos, and bought them. At the time, I was buying so many photographs that I was putting them into boxes and putting them into storage, much the same way Vivian did. It's Vivian Meyer. A very unique self-portrait. Vivian never saw anything like the beautiful large prints that are being made today. When she saw prints at all, they were usually small ones like these, supplied by the drugstore or made by her in her lodgings. Ron's collection would be dwarfed by others. There was a gentleman named Randy who bought some. One man, John Maloof, left an absentee bid on a box of negatives. It's just a little bit of everybody. So that's kind of where her work kind of went. Boop. When I went through some boxes in 2008, I pulled out the slides and went, wow, these are cool. Posted some on my website. John starts making prints from Vivian's negatives and selling them on eBay. Alan Secula, who's an art professor in California, contacted John and said, this is very important. At this point was where he went, ding, okay. He started collecting as much of the work as he could. So Vivian's pictures were starting to appear online, but who was making the selection? It worries some people. I'll be the first to honor the quality of the work. But at the same time, I'm concerned because we're only seeing pictures that the people who bought the suitcases decided to edit. And, and what kind of editors are they? What would she have edited out of this work? And what would she have printed? How do any of us know who the real Vivian Meyer is. So you were telling the world about Vivian. Did you ever think to seek out Vivian yourself? John and I both Googled up Vivian and were searching for. We could find no information. The first thing that popped up was her obituary after she passed away. John Maloof now owns the lion's share of Vivian's work. He declined to take part in this film because he's making his own. The second biggest owner is now Jeff Goldstein, an artist and carpenter. You've changed your entire life, Jeff. You've given up your vocation, and now you're just in the Vivian Meyer business. Right. And you're not the only one. There's Ron, and of course, there's John Maloof. What does that make you feel? Well, we spend half of our time trying to push our projects forward, and I think we spend the other half trying not to look like public assholes. <laughs> We're under global scrutiny. Her house is right around the corner up here. Uh, and this is a pretty tough neighborhood to be in. There was a fair amount of drug activity, a fair amount of crime takes place. So this was her, her last residence here. That's the door? Yeah. Did she photograph a lot around this area? She did, along the stretch of Howard Street. There's a beautiful shot coming off the bridge, looking down, in fact, this way, the, the train tracks. Uh, she fell and hit her head actually right by those tracks. Really? And she was taken to a local hospital, resisted help, and they thought she would recover, but apparently that was not the case. So during that period when the storage locker sales were happening, she was in hospital, recovering from this accident? That's my understanding. Yeah, I really came into this about a year later, which in some ways is nice for me. How do you mean by that? She went into arrears, her lockers came up. Uh, 
I'm thankful to be one step removed from all of that. Jeff bought the bulk of his collection from Randy Prow, who'd bought it at Rogers Auctions. When these transactions take place, it's not for the faint of heart. It's not a standard art acquisition. People are on their guard. How did you get hold of these pictures? I initially went down to where Randy Prow lives on the, in southern Indiana. It's a good eight hour, eight hour drive from Chicago. And I brought along someone with me, a retired fireman, Chicago fireman, a uh, pretty burly good size guy. And I met up with Randy, who I never had met before, in an abandoned warehouse in a rundown section in this town. Randy had somebody with him for backup, so we both came into this being pretty leery of one another. Randy's guy was much bigger than my guy. You carried the money with you? Yeah. It looked like I had a vest with bricks attached to it. So like the type they wear in the, in the army for protection, I guess. Later, Randy was ready to sell even more of Vivian's work. More and more people were hearing about it. So the last purchase price was astronomical. It was something I couldn't handle alone. And so John Maloof and I got it together to make the last purchase of Randy Prow. I went down with John and his friend Tony. I had my friend Rick, who was an off-duty Chicago cop. Rick comes armed, and Randy brought his brother, who came armed. There was a great deal of intensity in that room, because you, you just don't know what may or may not happen. I was sweating some bullets in there. No pun intended. So who was this elusive woman who took these thousands of photographs? Often full of tenderness, like a parent's, but always from the outside. All these were taken in the 50s and 60s when she was working as a nanny in the suburbs north of Chicago. She worked in several houses, but for by far the longest time, with a family called the Ginsbergs. Vivian's family, they were very much a hub of that neighborhood. And I think she probably enjoyed it. Enjoyed the, um, the energy that flowed from their family. It was a prosperous community, probably predominantly Jewish. It was really a neighborhood in a very old-fashioned way. We ice skated, we went to the beach. She rode a bicycle. We all rode bicycles, children, but the grown-ups seldom did. And she always had her camera. I remember Vivian taking photographs of the kids as they were just lounging around and being surprised that there was no eye contact. She was just into her viewfinder. And um, it was fascinating uh, to see somebody who was uh, part of the group, but also had found a way to, um, to wall herself off from it. Her favorite camera helped with this. This is the same model as her first Rolleiflex. This opens. Artist and lecturer Pamela Banos showed us how. She's been researching Vivian's life, work, and tools. So we look through this viewfinder which you can see how difficult that is to see, to, to get accustomed to. Just, she looks straight down yeah. and out. So this is called a twin lens camera. You're actually looking through this upper lens, and the photograph is being made through the lower lens. One thumb would turn this dial. The other thumb would turn this dial. We press that button, and we've made the picture. Down in there to look, to look down lens. in a camera means you're not making eye contact with people. 
it. And for a woman photographer, it was a good disguise. Because to be out on the streets, you had to have the personality for it, but you also needed a tool that allowed you to stay invisible. And she looked like a school mom. She looked innocent. It allowed her to get into the living space of lots of people. When I look back at all the pictures, she was clearly focusing in on the relationship of children and their parents. Some of it was very sweet, but some of it was, um, I think, maybe judgmental. It may also have been that she was noticing something about that community, some kind of um, edginess and picking up on it. The camera presented this magical transition for her that allowed her to see people and to get places without being um, caught doing it. And people allowed it because she wasn't there. She was just in the viewfinder. In order to live in someone else's family and care for their kids, you have to be both present and absent at the same time. And she knew how to achieve that kind of balance, and she carried it out, it seems to me, in her work on the street, too. She's definitely non-threatening. Her eye was so excellent for catching not just the character of the people she was photographing, but also the moment in history. She got Chicago in the 50s and early 60s in a very precise way. She got the things that, um, that made it that moment. There was always a degree of separation between Vivian and everyone else. She was clearly a recluse. This house here was uh, my dad's dental office. And upstairs was a room that dad had given to Miss Meyer to stay. She actually completely filled the room with newspapers and pictures and stuff, so much that my dad had to put a steel jack underneath to hold the floor up, and he couldn't figure out why the ceiling was sagging. She did hoard things, and she brought a lot of possessions into the house. Her bedroom initially was very simple, uh, and in no short order, uh, she ended up bringing in all her possessions, boxes, newspapers, um, um, lots of clothes, lots of different items, uh, and it got to the point where um, this sparsely populated room uh, was unbelievably crowded, uh, and in fact you had to almost uh, narrow your, your way in uh, on the occasions that she, you know, she let you in um, because she was very, very private. It's really, really strange to see so many pictures of myself. I saw a few pictures when I was very little. Framed again. <laughs> but after that, no. I mean, she, she kept them all to herself, so no, I had no clue. My mom was a photography editor for newspapers. She worked with a lot of photographers, but Miss Meyer never, ever showed her any of the photos. So it was kind of unusual that way. I always called her Miss Mars, and that was what she wanted me to call her, or my parents, um, never Vivian. And she would take your head off if uh, you used anything else. Sometimes she would hand the box camera to me, and she wanted me to take a picture of herself. 
And I think he took that picture. <laughs> Let's see, half her head cut off, and uh, yeah. Now, uh, that would be me. <laughs> she wanted that focus of that camera just so. And she'd be frustrated because she didn't think I could get it to the point where she wanted it. She told me about the importance of the contrast between dark and light. When we go on our walks, she'd take me all over the place. After she got done with supper, she would leave and she would walk to this train station and headed towards Chicago area. That's all we knew. I never heard where she went. She never told anybody. And she would be very angry if we asked. Whenever she could, Vivian would take the train from the northern suburbs where she worked to downtown Chicago. The pictures that we're looking at were all taken within just a few blocks of here. The man sitting by an old subway station probably would have been taken right here. It was kind of panhandling. It was such a contrast to the life that she was leading in the suburbs. She was looking for people. The best way to capture the energy of a city and to understand the city is on the streets. She wasn't on a tour bus. She wasn't from afar, she was down at street level. Some of them aren't quite down and out, are they? Some of them are elderly people who are sort of rather ornate in their own way. It's funny because if, as you look at these different pictures, so many were taken on this corner. The Marshall Fields clocks were kind of a meeting place. People would say, meet me under the Marshall Fields clock. The camera is an instrument of detection. We photograph not only what we know, but also what we don't know. We're going on to the south side to meet Sarah Poretsky, a detective writer whose heroine also walked these mean streets. The dangers of this area, wandering around here, I mean, how do you see that mystery woman side of Vivian? My sense of her was that she didn't think about it, that she was so focused on her quest that she didn't think about whether she was personally at risk. I think she had an intense interest in people who in some ways were like her and were on the margins of the gl more glittery world that she worked for but wasn't part of. I think it can be reassuring to know that you're not alone in that kind of outsider world. And also, you know, she worked hard for a living, and these are people who worked hard for a living. I also get a sense of a, a kind of a loneliness or anomie that is, is really painful. And I wonder if she selected those shots out of her own sense of loneliness. She must have felt that there was something about her that was rootless, that wasn't weighted down and that as many images as she could take somehow gave her weight. 
photography can be kind of a lonely profession. And it is something that one actually has a lot of alone time with. That's probably part of her success. She had a lot of alone time. This is how she managed to do what she did. She actually was the personification of finding art. She walked into a picture, she saw it happening, she took a picture, and she left. Camera shop staff like Pat were among the few who ever got to see any of Vivian's pictures. She mostly showed me street scenes, sometimes some pretty bad neighborhoods. This woman was going on foot. And I'm honestly surprised that she just emerged unscathed. She would have been prey to someone who would have wanted the camera or something. I've been here since I was 14. And I can remember her sort of coming in as early as that. And it didn't matter the weather outside, but mainly it was in late in the afternoons. Yeah, she wore heavy uh, shit kicker shoes. Long skirts, dark clothing, wintertime heavy coats, lots of scarves. She treated people as people, uh, and whether she liked people, that was another story that day, or she didn't like people that day. And she did not like women who were trying to act like women. If you had makeup on, I think she basically would cut you off. Men, aggressive or too many questions, goodbye. But could someone else take care of me? I mean, she was right to the point. Sometimes, very rarely, she would uh, open up the roll to decide, she said, come here, and you know, you can look at him with me, but not too often, mainly it was private. I don't honestly remember the pictures. Just that it was black and white, and it was people things. With her Rolleiflex, she had just 12 shots and then had to reload the film. Not easy in the open air. She shot about a roll of film a day. She spent virtually all her earnings on film, equipment and storage. Unlike most photographers, Vivian tended to take just one shot and move on. Her hit rate was phenomenal. This is a roll of film and the order in which they were taken. It's kids getting on a bus in the morning for school. She drops them off and then she heads downtown and she starts photographing. You really get this sense of a day in the life or of a diary here and you can see how she moves through the street. If you put it all in a row, you would see one woman's life unfolding on film. In this way, you'd have an unbroken string of images of what she saw, of what her experiences were. This is what her big project was. It was her life. It was experiencing life through photography. She'll come upon somebody who seems to be either in crisis or contemplating something. It's people who seem to be kind of lost in a, in a world of deep thought. And she was able to capture this image. And this is really a portrait. It's a portrait of a person. It's, it's not just a shot of a, a random person walking down the street. She's captured a real raw emotion here. As interested as she was in other people, she gave away very little about herself. My father hired her in part because she had a European background, which my father did as well. Oftentimes, around the dinner table, for example, they would speak in French. Vivian was uh, a rather opinionated uh, woman. She had political leanings that I think were more on the left and, and feminist, but I would say that um, wholly apart from her, her political opinions is perhaps the way that she carried them off. Uh, she was uh, an extremely abrasive person and oftentimes it was pretty much in your face and that was Vivian. 
when people tried to elicit information about her, she would quickly change the topic. But in terms of her upbringing and background, uh, it was nothing that uh, I ever really um, got to know. She was creating a play for children in the backyard, and um, she was assigning roles to all the children. They said, well, what, you, what, what role are you going to play? And she just looked around and said, I'll be the mystery woman. There were times when the parents would ask her, so you lived in France, uh, was that during the occupation? And she'd respond, maybe. So she really enjoyed having this air of mystery. And I think the mystery is still there. In just the area of Chicago where Vivian lived, Pamela Banos is doing forensic research on what she calls Vivian Meyer's fractured archive, split between the different owners. These are ones that Vivian chose. That she chose to save. Yes. She's also she digging deep into Vivian's mysterious past. Hold in her hand and look at. I see Vivian Meyer as a woman who is the product of the legacy of the French women before her. She is the daughter of a woman who was the daughter of another woman who were all live-in servants um, in New York. She is also today somebody else entirely who I think has been vented by people who love a good story, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Her grandmother, Eugenie Gisseau, had a child out of wedlock at the age of 16. She left the Champsaur Valley of France, um, sort of a shamed woman. She arrives in New York in 1901, leaving her baby behind, and then essentially becomes a live-in cook for the rest of her life. So Vivian's grandmother, Eugenie, leaves her illegitimate daughter behind in France to become a cook. And then what happens? Um, in 1914, her daughter, Maria Gesso, arrives in Manhattan, traveling with an American woman as her private maid. She was in New York, never having seen her mother. In 1919, Vivian's mother married her father, an Austro-Hungarian, Charles Meyer. And on her marriage certificate, she changes her parents' names to make it look as though she's legitimate. She corrects the family history. So she sort of invents herself at this point, at least on paper. This Vivian Meyer story is filled with intrigue and secrecy and deception and privacy, which I think is a theme that, that goes throughout. Vivian told people she was born in France, but in fact, she was born in Manhattan in 1926. Age four, Vivian was living in St. Mary Street in the Bronx with her mother, but without her father or her elder brother. But there's a woman living with them from a neighboring village in France, a studio photographer, Jeanne Bertrand. Maybe she had some influence on Vivian, the photographer-to-be. Jeanne Bertrand had had an illegitimate child whom she'd given up to adoption, and she'd since had a mental breakdown. We have these French women with no families. We have babies with no fathers. We have this connection of women who are displaced, who then end up living with other families or give their children to other families or give their children up. Vivian Meyer appears to have had very few personal relationships. She certainly never got married. We don't know of any, any other relationship. So that would suggest this displacement comes from the circumstances. In 1932, Pamela finds Vivian's mother using the Swiss Benevolent Society, Home for Single Women, as her address in an advert she places in the paper for a job as a chambermaid. She's now calling herself Mademoiselle Chausseau. Within months, she gives up and they go up to France for six years. Mm. 
Vivian was to live in her mother and grandmother's village in France from the age of six to 12. She was seen as something of an outsider. Later, Vivian was to take thousands of photographs here. J'ai eu mon attention attirée parce qu'elle les faisait travailler mon imagination. She captured my attention because she made my imagination work. Elle était... She came from America. Elle venait d'Amérique. L'Amérique, c'est l'Eldorado. It's El Dorado. Surtout pour une petite fille de 10 ans. Especially for a little girl of 10. For me, she was an extraterrestrial. Un extraterrestre qui arrivait d'Amérique. Who had arrived from the United States. Elle avait toujours le nez en trompette. She had a turned up nose. Et la goutte au nez. And a runny nose. L'appartement où elle logeait n'était pas très confortable. The flat très where chaud. they stayed was not very comfortable or very warm. Elle ne pensait pas toujours comme nous. She didn't think like us at all. Je me souviens d'un jour. Remember one day we noticed some chickens. Des poules qui picoraient. And scratching in a farmyard. Elle avait été dégoûtée. She was disgusted and decided de never to eat eggs heures. again. <laughs> All the boys in the village were very pleased to be in her company. She was a bit reserved. I'd often see her in the village square playing Marel, a game where you draw squares, there's hell and heaven, paradise, and you jump by throwing a stone. I remember she threw it a long way. We were all looking at her knickers. C'est ma mère. That's my mother. My mother. C'est ma mère. Dans le magasin, nous avions un magasin. In the shop. Une pâtisserie. We had a cake shop. Elle est bien cette photo. Je voudrais bien la voir. It's good this photo. I'd like to have it. Usually she was preoccupied. There was so much work. But here she looks calm. To slay bien bien loin. All that is very, very long ago. After 12 more years in New York, a 24-year-old Vivian visited the village again. It was soon after the Second World War. How she learned to use a camera remains a mystery, but she knew what she was doing. These are her first known pictures, previously dismissed as snapshots. When I started looking through these pictures, I started wondering which photographs these people were talking about because what I was seeing was extremely different. This is not a child working with an innocent machine. This is a woman who knows how to work a camera. This is the box camera, the humble snapshot camera. Literally, it has one, one shutter speed and no other adjustment. And the suggestion is that this is what she used in, in France. Right. But she wasn't, in fact, that she might have been using a camera not dissimilar to this. Correct. This particular camera is probably from the 1940s. You can focus it. You can adjust the shutter speeds. Yeah. You can adjust the apertures. You could fold it down, and it collapses into itself. This could also be considered a traveler's camera. She was developing the skills that would become her hallmark. Right early on, you see her observe a character sitting uh, on a stoop or something in a public space, and she works around him. She followed her inner line of curiosity. And it's that that establishes an artistic tendency, because the amateur doesn't do that. Vivian was in France to sort out the sale of a farm that belonged to her great-aunt, who died during the war. It was called Beauregard. Beautiful view. Her grandfather lived nearby. He was poor, teased by the village boys, almost an outcast. It was a horrible echo of what would happen to Vivian herself, and to her mother, 
who would end up in a seedy hotel in New York. Nelly lived next door. It's me there, like two sisters. Wherever I went, she'd come with me. What everybody said was they all thought she was a spy because she took photographs all over the place. My parents and I never thought anything like that. Look at her there, she's beautiful. It looks just like her. She was refined and sincere above all. That's what I remember about her. On Sundays, we'd all go to dances, but she didn't go to dances. <coughs> and she never married. She never made a life for herself. Yet she's a pretty woman. This morning, you brought me something which has made me very happy to see her again. It was a joy. Vivian roamed the area, taking views of mountains and monuments. She was, it seems, making postcards through the camera shop in the village. So maybe at this point, she was hoping to make photography into a career. The spy story grew, and the idea that she had a gun to defend herself. A woman wandering alone is the stuff from which myths are made. In the nearby town of Gap, she photographed a Communist Party rally, and she was always seeking out people living on the edge. In the spring of 1951, she heads back across the ocean to New York. It's as though Vivian was seeing the city in which she'd spent most of her life for the first time. She's 26 years old when she's doing this. Hopeful years, when you have your life ahead of you. She's learned everything so fast. She's learned how to look and she's going to places that are new. We're actually walking in her footsteps. It feels sort of uncanny to look through the camera and see the same things. And then I guarantee you she shoots the East River right here. This is obviously something that we can catch better on foot than, a, than in a car. goes to these heights and creates these vistas. These reminded me of the photographs that she had shot in the Alps in France when she was there in 1950. Now, like her grandmother and mother before her, she turned to domestic service and started to work as a nanny. And ever more intensely as a photographer. She's on the balcony of the Hotel Astor for the Macy's Day Parade. She, you can see from the right, she's actually standing with a bunch of children. These children might be her charges, right? They might be, right. She gets access to these places because she's working for wealthy families who get access to places. But often, she creates her own access. So she's standing in the shadow here by this wall, seeing Salvador Dali behind that post actually giving an autograph to a woman at the doorway to the Museum of Modern Art. She actually walks down the street here, following Dali, and shoots the second photograph. And she's caught him in this moment. She dates the photograph to the 24th of January, 1952, and this is the time when there's the exhibition Five French Photographers at the Museum of Modern Art. So I'm assuming that she crossed that doorway and she went into the museum and she saw this exhibition. She was teaching herself about photography. And it's now that Vivian made the switch to her trademark camera, the Roloflex, with its large square negative. 
It's the first Raleigh Flex picture I found, and it's taken in the, on the 12th of July, 1952, as she writes on the back of the print. She's capturing the vivid contrast of the city. She's found her subject matter. In 1952, the hottest summer on record in New York, Vivian is crossing the city with her new camera. This is the Third Avenue train that she took up and down, and when it gets down below a certain point, it's the Bowery. So by the time she leaves New York, the train is being dismantled. Now, the Bowery is as gentrified as the rest of Manhattan, but then it was a byword for drunks and down and outs. Have you ever heard of the Bowery bums, where we have like people like this man who has been beat up and he's asleep or he's unconscious in this cart, and men who are alcoholics and passed out on the sidewalk, on this sunny summer day where she's here. She's actually standing over there taking a photograph of this man who's looking down at her because she's got her Roliflex at her waist. He's looking at us, but he's looking into the lens in this picture. She had to be about three feet away to get a close-up. To go up and photograph a stranger on the street, you have to hold your ground and be fearless and take what you want, because it's yours. You could see that there was something that she was interested in, that she was going to, drawn to, day after day. She would keep on working certain themes, the underdog, the, uh, the cast aside, the, the, the worker. You are too young to fall asleep forever. And when you sleep, you remind me of the dead. She has the tools, and her work is really taking off. And so is she. This is the document that actually shows her actual she planned a whole year away, but she needed a new passport. So these images show how she kept her own archive by photographing her own documents. This is the uh, photograph of her 1959 passport application that shows she's lied about her parents' death. She checks that both of her parents are deceased. She when checks? She checks that both of her parents are deceased and in fact also eliminates her mother's name from the application entirely. In fact, both her parents lived another 10 years, but in 1959, they're dead to her. She's cut loose. She actually lists all the places she's going. She's going to the Philippines, Hong Kong, Indochina, Siam, East Indies, Malaysia. And she did this tour. She actually did this she tour? She did this tour. And did she take many photographs? She took thousands of photographs. So, more than 50 years ago, a single nanny sets off on a world tour. This is before motorways, before mass air travel, before gap years. She fits in a second visit to her village in France to pick up a check for her great aunt's property. This time, she also takes in Versailles and the Louvre. People make an issue of her being untaught, but she was teaching herself. Her visit to Paris coincides with that of the US president, so she shoots that too. She's like a reporter, but with no newspaper, no outlet. It's really about being alive to the world, out in the world and seeing yet another moment of, 
of consciousness in which an awakened state is what it's all about, that you are privileged to see that yet again. This life is doing this for me. You're dealing with the disappearing moment. It's there and it's gone. And the only way that it's recognized as having happened is you observing it, knowing it, and photographing it. So you are the repository. And, and I, I, I think that um, you know, it's great if you can make prints out of it and share this, but at a certain point, if you've done it long enough, you don't really, you don't really have to. It's for you. It's just for you. But maybe working alone with no audience was too much of a strain in the end. It seems the center would not hold. The world had opened out, but by the late 60s was closing in for Vivian. The shelter she'd found with the Ginsburg family in Chicago came to an end. It wasn't until all the Ginsburg boys went to college that finally Mrs. Ginsburg said, Vivian, maybe it's time now for you to go on. And breaking up was very hard for them and the family. The Ginsburg family very prominently said that she was like Mary Poppins. Almost all the other families that I talked to all say that Mary Poppins is about the last adjective, uh, a phrase that they would use in talking about Vivian. She did have her dark side and she had her light sides. When she taught me, that was wonderful. That was just wonderful. But you know, her emotions could get better of her sometimes and so just leave her be. Oh, you didn't want her to get angry with you, believe me. Where there'd been pleasure, excitement, increasingly there was disappointment and dread. She witnessed the Chicago riots in 1968. Bobby Kennedy being assassinated, the chaos that was going on in 68, and her photography very much, you get that sense of it. Her work after that, she would go to the same places, she would go take the same kinds of walks, but instead of noticing beautiful abstractions on the sidewalk and beautiful light coming through trees, she'd start to see garbage. When you see the weight of all these images, thousands of images, just the mildewing wet newspapers and garbage cans, it, there's a weight to it and there's, an, there's a power to it. And I don't think you can deny that it somehow is linked to who she was. It was all bad news. It was as if she was drowning, as if she'd given up on people. As the years passed, her jobs got shorter, her hoarding and secretive behavior more extreme. It was a little bit of a mystery what she did during the weekends where she stayed. She would, you know, take her belongings, her possessions, uh, often bags um, of clothes that she would, she would have, always with her camera. Uh, and likewise, she would return sometimes with, you know, new bags and more clothing. No work exists beyond the 1980s, but she was still carrying her camera, still putting rolls of film in her own personal bucket at central cameras, rolls she couldn't afford to collect. That was her major difficulty the last 15, 20 years. Economics, not having enough economics. She couldn't afford all of the things that she wanted. Maybe more work will still emerge, but maybe she would have preferred 
if it didn't. I don't think she would like it at all. No. There's too much going on. Too much delving into who she was and what she was and why was she this and so on and the trickle downs and the trickle ups and hey, I like taking pictures. That was her release. That was her world. I didn't go to the shows to see uh, the interpretation of other people of what they felt about her because I have my own feelings about her and I respect the way she was. Maybe I would have learned something but would have been the truth. I don't know. It would have been someone else's interpretation of a truth. Yet she's caught the imagination of a world captivated with taking pictures incessantly on their phones. Vivian has gone viral. She now lives on the web. But she lived in her imagination. Her compulsion to take pictures was her life. It's what she has left behind. Some of the pictures of Vivian's were from when I was a kid. Because I was probably there and I didn't even realize. I probably walked past her, but I never would have known. He contacts Ben and see what's happening with the May show in Shanghai. Yeah. They say artwork isn't artwork until it's shared. Somebody else has to see it. She did have a very private life, so I think she would not be very happy about that, about people knowing about her. As her story dissipates and our stories dissipate, as they should, uh, and the work remains, that's, I think she would be thrilled with it. In 200 years of people are looking at her work, I'd be absolutely delighted, and I think she would be also. You know, at some point, I think I'm going to give some away, maybe one a week for a bunch of weeks and see what happens. Give them back to the street, so to speak. Look at all this. This is only one third of what I have. There's three times this, so there's more than enough. There's people grabbing cameras right now. They're doing a lot of street photography because of Vivian. I can't give away the rabbits. <laughs> it's my favorite. must have been around 2007 or so, I was on my way to work and I saw her walking down the street. And I had a moment where I thought, oh, should I come out, walk over and say hello? And I just didn't, you know, I, was, I was running a little late and I just thought, so I stood there and I just kind of walked, watched her walk. And I thought, wow, Vivian's still going strong. That is strange. Right at the end of her life, a neighbor caught sight of her round the rubbish bins. I first saw her in the neighborhood, in the alleys. She used to be carrying shopping bags, books. I thought she was homeless. When I swim, I started noticing over here. She used to sit over here behind these trees. Kind of a, I don't know, out of the way. She didn't really want she didn't want to be bothered. I think she knew she was different. She'd just be staring at the lake. I'd swim for a half hour out there and I'd look up and she would be gone. Said I started to heaven, Lord, but I changed my mind. Said I started to heaven, Lord, but I changed my mind. Said I'm gonna stay right here where I can have better time. Have mercy, Mr. Percy. 